What is up, weather enthusiasts? I'm your host, Pat's Path Predictor. Let's get right into the weather. All right, so here's the situation we have for you ladies and gentlemen. This video, we're going to mainly be talking about kind of like the overall hurricane threat once again, and kind of giving a timeline of when the first hurricane will form and when the first hurricane will strike any given area. So... That's kind of the main basis of this video. I know we have some tropical waves that are currently out there across the main development region and was the gyre that's going on in Central America. However, there's not really going to be that much uh, tropical development anticipate. anticipate. I know I, t I tagged them on the thumbnail and all that stuff, but that's just mainly to show you that, hey, these things are there, and while they're not a threat now... They could be a big threat in the future, so we're going to have to pay very close attention to that. But with that being said, let's go ahead and dive right into it. So overall, we're not going to be using too many models except for looking at wind shear and maybe the moisture and everything like that in the short term, which we'll go ahead and start doing it uh, with first. So here's the European model pulled up right here. This is the 0Z as of today. And this is what we have right here. We have our wind shear forecast. Overall, the wind shear across a lot of these areas is kind of mixed. You have some areas of low wind shear, some areas of very high wind shear, especially in the Gulf of Mexico and those areas right there. So we're going to have to pay close attention to that. We can corroborate this with what we're looking at with the total um, current forecast right here, not the current forecast, the current OBS and everything like that so that's what we're looking at right here overall uh, around 40 knots of wind shear or so is the max across much of the air, uh, the atlantic ocean right there which typically if you are looking at this in uh, j early june right there you'd want to see on average more like 50 or 60 knots in a couple areas right there this is probably going to be one of those fluctuation periods and then the wind shear is going to increase again in a couple of days and that stuff so we'll have to keep an eye on that and we can go ahead and show you what we're looking at with the european yeah typically we're going to see a lot of that in the gulf of mexico but overall we do start to see a weakening trend of the wind shear for at least for the next 24 hours before it starts to re-strengthen in the caribbean and the main development region this is why you're not seeing very much tropical development even though it is june 9th and hurricane season started on june 1st this is the reason why you're not seeing very much tropical development right here it's just because you have a lot of wind shear and tropical uh, systems Systems do not like wind shear. I mean, severe weather absolutely loves wind shear, but tropical systems that don't have any fronts and really and a lot of these small systems just get torn apart by this. But overall, you're going to see a fluctuation of wind shear just going up and down, up and down, although you're going to start seeing some consistency around the main development region right here. You're going to see this whole thing be consistently high of wind, uh, wind shear, at least for the next few days or so. And as we continue to move into the next uh, second half of June at the end of this week, we're going to have to pay very close attention to what is coming up after that because we may be looking at some, a couple of tropical waves that start to organize and develop stuff off into the Caribbean Sea. We also have the as Azores High right here that is incredibly strong to take a look at, incredibly strong 1029 uh, uh, hectopascals or 1029 millibars right there and that's going to really enhance those steering cu currents and allow these systems to move more so into the Caribbean and all that stuff so we'll have to pay very close attention to that right there and right now let's go ahead and pull up the GFS just to kind of cross check this we're going to use the 0z for some consistency reasons and I want to kind of see a longer term forecast from this just to get a general idea of what could possibly be going on. So here's what we have for the GFS. Here's what we're seeing is kind of interesting. After we get uh, past 12 days, we're going to start seeing a weakening of the wind shear in the western part of the Atlantic Ocean and the western Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico. Do I, I don't think this, uh, this is realistically going to happen. It's way too far out to kind of give an indication to that. But I do find it kind of interesting to take a look at. Looks like the tropics are going to start opening up for business pretty soon, like I said, in the second half of June. We could see a, poss a possibility of two to three named storms this month. I still think it's rightfully true. Uh, that's true. And another thing I'm paying attention to, which I find is kind of interesting, is the fact that uh, you know, uh, you know, this reminds me a lot of the 2017 hurricane season because aside from an April named storm and uh, tropical storm Arlene out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, we really didn't have that much activity going into June. We had Brett, yes, and we had Cindy. Yeah, those are your two named storms that we had. But we didn't really have very much afterward. We had Dawn in, Jul uh, in, late in mid to late July. 
and then you had and then you had an, an Emily um, pretty much as a tropical storm move over Florida in early August and then you start seeing things really ramp up for a lot of things like you start really seeing this stuff ramp up and around the second week of August you had Franklin then great then Gert then you had Harvey and then you had a massive just full-blown cluster of hurricanes pretty much from September August August all the way through September and into October as well which was quite crazy to take a look at September 2017 was pretty insane and based on the setup I think this is going to be an, another similar situation to 2017 although I do think a 2020 hybrid could be possible into the in this at least for the later parts of the hurricane season because of what we're potentially seeing with the global sea temperatures. We've been going over and over and over and over about this, but this is very important. The global sea, uh, sea surface temperatures across much of the Atlantic are way above average. In fact, we've been monitoring this the last few days. We're seeing a lot more areas of 30 plus degrees Celsius or 86 plus degree Fahrenheit for those of you who live in the United States. Warm waters, especially in the in the Gulf of Mexico, Bay of Campeche right here, starting to exit that region. The loop current is well over that. You're starting to see more areas in the coast of Florida and even getting closer to the loop current right there of 30 plus degrees Celsius. And even into parts of the Bahamas, especially around Cuba, uh, the Isle of Youth, and a lot of areas in the Caribbean are starting to uh, see those areas pop up more and more over a period of time. So we're going to have to pay very close attention to that. And you also have this area, which has been there for quite a while. So we'll have to keep a very close eye on it. MDR is still very primed for these uh, warm waters and very primed for hurricane season already in the month of June. The only thing that's, like I said, stopping it is the wind shear right there. So ne and we'll go ahead and pull up the next thing when it comes to warm water, which is ocean heat content. This is a very interesting thing I'm taking a look at right here because the OHC values already are where we were, I believe, in August of last year. I'd say I not I would say late July, early August. We can go ahead and cross check that right here. We can go ahead to 2023. Matter of fact, let's go ahead and see what we were seeing in June of last year, just to take a look at right here. It is uh, on June 9th. This is what we were seeing on June 9th. We weren't seeing nearly as much OHC. I mean, we were starting to see quite a bit of it in the loop current, and especially in parts of the the Atl of the Caribbean Sea and the main development region over there. But compared to where we are this year. Uh, which is pretty scary to th think about right here. Yeah, not nearly as much as where we were right now. And that's just going to show what happens when you don't have hurricanes hitting a certain body of water. I mean, we had a Dahlia hit the Gulf, but not much other than that. But then again, you have it can rely on cold fronts and that kind of stuff to cool down the waters and everything like that since there is a lot of severe weather, winter weather that happens in the United States. But that doesn't happen in the Caribbean Sea. You don't see a lot of fronts going through the Caribbean. And all that warm water that was untapped last year, like I said with Weather Center Nazario, we were talking about this like back in October. It just sat there and allowed for the uh, for the OHC to kind of remain there for a bit. I mean, there was some cold fronts that moved through that cooled it down a little bit. But then it really started warming up once again, once we got into pretty much March, April, May, and now into June, and we're seeing OHC values cracking 150 in a lot of these areas, yeah, that's not very good if you don't want hurricanes right there. And we are still seeing these record high temperatures right there, although we are looking at a kind of a closing in for the 2023 uh, warm waters, although there was a bit of a, a kind of a, a, a drop off right here for some of these areas right there. So we'll have to see what happens uh, going forward, but overall, we are still going to see these waters surge, and we are still going to see these waters get much warmer than average. So that's the main thing we're paying attention to. Another thing I'm paying attention to is the main develop uh, is, uh, is the Matt and Julian oscillation, and I've been kind of toying around with this a little bit. I really wish that this would update to the current day, so that way we take we could take a look at it. Unfortunately, it's not really doing that right now, no matter how many times I keep refreshing the page to kind of go for to June 9th. We'll have to take a look at it right there. Then again, it is from the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, so I'm not 100% sure if they go past June 1st or not. Well, hopefully they can update this very soon so we can take a look at it. But regardless, what we're seeing is pretty interesting. In fact, I have a tweet I want to go ahead and pull up from my buddy David Schlothauer right here. He was posting this right here. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this. 
Now, while I forecast the tropics to remain fairly quiet, other than the central G uh, American gyre, we take a look at uh, that. We t uh, we look to make up for that by July, as intraseasonal El Nino rapidly fades and the MJO becomes more active and constructively interferes with the developing La Nina pattern. And this is what David's talking about right here. This is the ENSO forecast that he has pulled up. There is going to be a more active. Um, Excuse, uh, excuse me, there's going to be more of an active MJO cycle, at least in parts of the Maritime Continent and Indian Ocean right there. It's not going to really be as prevalent in the Western Hemisphere and Africa or anything like that. That usually isn't the case until we get to July or, and stuff like that, but we'll have to pay close attention to it. This is what the Euro is forecasting, GFS forecasting. Yeah, we're going to see more active MJO. And a more active MJO, typically at least in the area, it's kind of in, what it does is it, it, it enhances the convective activity, although tropical development isn't always right, uh, isn't always there, mainly because of wind shear, and another for, uh, thing that I was kind of ignoring up until this point, dry air is also a reason wh uh, why that you don't see this stuff happening. There's quite a bit of dry air going on across a lot of these regions right here. I mean, it's not nearly as much as we were seeing last year. I mean, that was crazy. Even 2022, that was an insane year for the Sahara dust. But we were still seeing quite a bit of dry air intruding and just kind of moving through a lot of these regions right there. Although we're still seeing that as of right now, we're looking at the forecast for the at least the next four days. Yeah, we're going to see a lot of dry air in the main development region. That's why you're not seeing very much tropical development right there. Just that, as well as the lack of vor any real, real vorticity going on right here. We can show you the 850 vorticity right there. There is like main emit latitude vorticity up here, but that's not tropical right there. So we don't really need to worry about that. But yeah, you're not seeing a lot of vorticity uh, through a lot of these regions right here. And that's just... Uh, you're just not seeing very many tropical waves right now that have that vorticity aspect to it that help it organize and develop. Part of it's because of the dry air, and part of it's because the wind shear keeps tearing it apart, ladies and gentlemen. So we'll have to keep a close eye on that. But yeah, the dry air, much less than last year, but still going to be a prevalent factor into what we were dealing with just a, a little bit ago. So let's go ahead. I want to take a look at the uh, wind shear anomalies that the European is forecasting right here, just to get a general look at what we're potentially looking at, because we are seeing lower wind shear than average from what I was seeing previously. I know this is a bit of a disorganized video. I apologize for that. But interestingly enough, we uh, but interestingly enough, it actually persists for a little while right here. It, there is some more shear that uh, kind of happens in the MDR again, more shear than average means less tropical activity right here, but we'll, and we'll have to pay close attention to that for sure. And I want to go ahead and take a look at the GFS to kind of cross-check this. Yeah, that stays prevalent for the next little while, although we do start to see a bit of a decrease of the shear anomalies right here going into uh, the next little while. So we'll have to pay close attention to that. Now, when do I think a timeline is, are we going to see for our, our first tropical storm, first hurricane, first major hurricane, all that stuff? Well, it's not going to happen in uh, at least the hurricane aspect of it is not going to happen in June. You're going to see some tropical storms happen in June. We might honestly in G in June if it is does happen, it's going to be a 75 mile per hour cat one. It's going to be one of those borderline cases like it usually is. I mean, we had tropical storm Brett last year and what we saw with that was we saw a 70 mile per hour tropical storm that almost became a hurricane, but the shear tore it apart the last second and it stayed a tropical storm as it approached the Lesser Antilles. So we could see another one of those scenarios right there if the wind shear holds at this area right there, possibly a second tropical cyclone. First hurricane, I think, is pretty interesting. It's going to depend on what happens when the Sahara dust lets up, and it's going to depend on how much wind shear there is going into July. Because what we saw last year, we saw Hurricane Dawn. And the middle of July, like middle smack of July, that was the earliest hurricane I had seen since covering the Pat's Path uh, Predictor Channel since starting it. But I know it's not the most, uh, I know it's not the earliest time we've seen a hurricane. There have been a lot earlier scenarios of that. But either way, it was a pretty crazy situation to take a look at. First hurricane, 
if it does happen if it does happen in July, it's going to be a brief one, but other than that, I would say early August is when you're going to start seeing your typical situation happen right there. And then for major hurricanes, that's not going to be till August or September. So we'll have to pay close attention to that as more information continues to come out. We're going to close the video out right here. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. It helps us out. It helps us make more videos like these. The goal of this channel, as always, is to get more people engaged with weather. And with that being said, have a wonderful day, guys. Stay safe.